state to state. We got your Nittany line update. It's a football discussion with Tom and Justin. So kick back and press play. With former Penn State and NFL defensive back Justin King, I'm Tom Hannafin. This is State of State. This podcast is presented by Bet Online. The tournament is here. Bet Online is your bracket headquarters this season with the best bracket contest out there, plus odds, lines, and info on every game and every round right up until the national championship. You can access the most up to the minute wagering information anytime from your desktop or your mobile devices, and even track your bracket in real time all the way through the tournament. Head to Bet Online today and get in on all the action. Remember, Remember, use our promo code believe that's b l e a v for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. State of State is presented by Bet Online. The game starts here. Are you looking for a higher potential return on your savings? Turn to our sponsor Save as an SEC registered investment advisor. Save safely combines the best parts of saving and investing with its market savings program. Market savings is a savings product that provides you with market returns instead of interest. The returns come from diversified investment portfolios based on your individual investment profile. The return from the investments is paid to you at the end of the selected investment term. But Investing comes with risk, right? Well, with SAVE, your deposit is FDIC insured and never used for any investments. The current variable APYs are 9.07% for the one-year product and 7.9% for the five-year product. So what does this cost you? Well, SAVE only charges a fee when your investments make you money. To learn more or to sign up, visit www.joinsave.com slash state. That's joinsave.com slash state. The link to the website is in the description of this podcast. State of State invites you to join Save. Penn State football's 2024 spring practices have been underway for a little while now. We've got a little bit of time to process what's been happening. I want to thank you all so much for checking out the interview we had last week with former Penn State defensive back Daquan Hardy. We wish him the best in the upcoming NFL draft. I'm sure he's going to land someplace spectacular. We are going to dive into some of the recent comments from James Franklin over the past week in regard to what he's seeing, what he's expecting out of practices and leading up to the blue-white game. Also, what he thinks of his three new coordinators, which is a big deal for this team, and also some players that might be potentially standing out at this point in the year as we get closer and closer to the blue-white game itself on April 13th. So again, like, comment, subscribe, rate us, turn on notifications, hit us up on social media, X, Instagram, and TikTok at State of State Pod. Check out all the content we have there. Let's start off with some of the comments from James Franklin that were last week in the beginning of practice. We were fortunate to have Day Day on last week, so we were not going to disrespect number 25, Justin. But let's first off go to a comment from James Franklin. This was in regard to how his brand new coordinators are getting adjusted. New defensive coordinator, Tom Allen. New offensive coordinator, Andy Kotelnicki. And new special teams coordinator, Justin Lustig. The exact quote from James Franklin in regard to all three of them and how they're assimilating was, quote, a lot of humility for the coaches. Tom, Andy, and Justin have been able to compromise. The core returning staff has helped with that process. Hearing that the coaches have shown a lot of humility and have been compromising, it worries me. It worries me. But I'm curious to hear what you think, Justin. I think any group of coaches that come into a new staff that especially has had success 11 plus one season, you have to have some compromise in your back pocket, right? Because they've had some success and you can try to integrate your schemes and your IP into what they've been doing. But when you have success, I think you kind of, keep things rolling on that train. And obviously you tweak the different areas that you need to increase um, production in and go from that standpoint. So there's probably a level of self-evaluation that's going on from both offensive and defensive standpoint where they had successes last year, where they need to make improvements, and then where the benefit of the new offensive coach, defensive coordinator, and special team coordinator, where their strengths are and where they can fix those weaknesses. And then in the other areas where it's kind of flat, I think that's where the compromise comes, right? Like, hey, there's more to one way to skin the cat. That's the one thing I learned from working at a league level um, 
situation and seeing eight different operations, whether it's philosophies, how these things are executed. As long as you have alignment from top down, from personnel, philosophy, how you coach, you should continue to operate. So there's compromise everywhere as long as it's aligned. <laughs> yes. And here's why this all worries me. I, I always defer to you because you, you work for James Franklin. You've worked in the National Football League. You've worked in the XFL. So I, I was curious to hear your, your front office evaluation on it. But here's why it's worrisome for me as a fan. And this is where, you know, my emotions get, get ramped up, right? So Penn State fires Mike Yurcich following the Michigan loss, that, that debacle. And then that left two games the remainder of the season. We had the co-offensive coordinators for the Rutgers game and the Michigan State game. I think it's very easy to say that that Michigan State team was not very good and that Rutgers game was better than Michigan State, but still not one of the best teams within the Big Ten, right? Lesser competition. Right. Rutgers a home game, Michigan State a, a road game to close out the season. The thing that worries me is that in those two weeks, the remainder of the regular season in 2024, James Franklin was talking about, he's like, man, the collaboration has been better. The communication has been better amongst the offensive coordinators now that are working together. As if to imply that there was not good collaboration when Mike Yurcich was there. As if to imply that Mike Yurcich was saying, it's my way or the highway, and James Franklin maybe felt like he didn't have the control that he wanted. This is me speculating and guessing. But to hear that these new coordinators are coming in and they have to compromise it's a worry that I've expressed before is that we're now on what the sixth offensive coordinator, especially for James Franklin in his tenure at Penn state compromising means going to exactly what James Franklin wants the offense to be. I think it's safe to say that Penn state fans haven't really been content with the Penn state offense since Joe Moorhead was here. And it's pretty well documented that Joe Moorhead really stood up for what his offensive system was. Granted, he had generational talents like Saquon Barkley, like Trace McSorley, at quarterback. The list goes on and on in terms of the offensive skill that was there that he was able to utilize. He could kind of do what he wanted and get away with murder to a degree. <laughs> but I sit here and I'm like, oh, you're telling Andy Kotelnicki to come in and compromise when I thought the idea was to utilize – similar personnel, similar formations, but blend in his explosive play calling ability that he showed at Kansas and Buffalo. To hear the word compromise early, I'm like, it's it's a point I brought up before, Justin. Is this just going to be a new dude calling the same damn offense that I've seen since Joe Moore had left? Well, I'll use some evidence of impacts in the positive manner, right? Because I think Please when do. many... I will, because I think when Manny Diaz came in from a head coach standpoint to the defensive coordinator, that he compromised a lot with his offense, whether it was having hard times before with Penn State's third down defense and how it got a little bit more aggressive. You heard Daquan last week on the episode, episode say where Brent Pry had more of a drop zone type of coverage and Manny Diaz had more of a tack man style yeah. defense. And we've seen yeah. the outcomes. Right. But across the board, like the personnel that was built with pride and how they were playing, there were still things that they did well that they had to clean up. And then you add Manny Diaz's defensive philosophy, his IP into the situation in critical third down areas. So he compromised last year and there was a great success on the defense. Maybe there, maybe the offense didn't compromise last year and it was more like, all right, I'll, I'll trust you. I'll trust you. And they didn't like the outcome. And they're kind of leaning to what ha the, the, the positivity that happened last year when they made, uh, some level of compromise with the defensive staff that was there. Cause you gotta look at, I mean, you gotta look at the consistency that the defensive staff has had versus the offensive staff. And there's a lot more turnover on the offense than there has been on the defense. So we've seen when someone comes in and there's a stable group that has been there together as the new person coming in makes the compromise that you can escalate things and throw uh, gasoline on the fire pretty, pretty efficiently and quickly to the outcomes that you want. So, that's where I would be leaning into it for the offense, but I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> I love betting with my friends, and Cut is perfect for just that. The Cut app is a peer-to-peer -peer social betting platform that's legal in 40-plus states. Cut has customizable odds, tracking capabilities, and an entire social network with group chats, user profiles, and rewards, and especially 
with March Madness upon us, I can hit up my friends all over the country for every imaginable bet the big dance can possibly offer us. It's the best. Use our promo code Believe Penn State. That's B L E A V Penn State for a 10% welcome deposit bonus. Again, don't forget the promo code Believe Penn State. That's B L E A V Penn State. Cut. Put your money where your mouth is. State of State is a proud supporter of Blue White Outfitters. Blue White Outfitters was created as a retail shop meant to highlight the confidence, competitiveness, and fearlessness of the elite athletes found throughout the history of Penn State University. Check out their Lockdown U and Lawn Boys merchandise today. All sales from Blue White Outfitters directly benefit Penn State student athletes. Visit www.bluewhiteoutfitters.com today. Yeah, here's another thing that worries me. So our good friends at Blue White Illustrated had access to uh, spring practices and Thomas Frank Carr had put out something on social media, my dear friend. And uh, it was a clip of the quarterbacks for Penn State during spring practices doing ball security drills. It looked like prepping for a little bit more incorporation of the option into the offense. Now, this shouldn't surprise anybody that's familiar with Andy Kotelnicki. It's something he's used, used especially at Kansas because they had two very athletic quarterbacks. So you could understand that example. But <laughs> that's not Drew Aller's game, is it? Is it? <laughs> and I talked about it after the Rutgers game where Drew Aller got hurt because I think they ran him on quarterback design runs. I think about 10 times and he injured his throwing shoulder in the process. And I have, I have heard from James Franklin in his press conference that kicked off spring practice that he's like Drew's body composition is better and that he's about the same weight, but he looks leaner. He looks like he's in better conditioning altogether. Not to say that he was bad, but just that's the work of the strength team as mm -hmm. the time has gone on his time at Penn state. I just now I'm worried that we're going to get to September and it's going to be Drew Aller running the option and you're putting a quarterback who is not really designed to do that at the Big Ten level. He could have gotten away with it in high school, but he's not Vince Young. He's he's a little bit more of a pocket guy. I, I, I don't want to disrespect him entirely. Yes, he's nimble. He can move a little bit, but I really hate the idea of design runs for Drew Aller and I'm just scared that that's that's where this is going. Well, I think we got to look at the different phases of the calendar in a football season. If we saw this week one preparing for West Virginia, I would share the sentiment of like, oh, what's going on? But in spring ball, the purpose of a new offensive coordinator is the under like in the install period is to put in your base level concepts into the situations of the offense. So I think Andy Kolenick is coming in and just showing like, hey, these are the base things that we're going to build off of. And so for in order for his offense to work, you have to have the base level fundamentals down. And I think uh, quarterback design runs, we say it's going to be a heavy run, but obviously the, um, what am I, the RPO situation is something that comes in with his offense. So to have a base level of install, that's what we're probably seeing in spring ball, which is the main thing is to get your core fundamentals of your offense and defense in, in, in line. And then you add on to those things and throw that into the wrinkles to keep the defense on. So like, that's how I would look at the spring going forward. But I will say that I don't like Drew running the football either. But if he's there's no threat to run, it probably messes up the rest of his offense in terms of install, preparing what the defense is showing. Because again, we're probably going through an offseason of self-scout and evaluation. And so you have to make things look a certain type of way, look the same, and then throw those different wrinkles in there. So Drew has to have the ability to put some fear or at least keep the defense of defense honest to run the RPO if that's going to be a base level of his offensive identity. That aspect, yes. Keeping the defense honest, I'm fine with. And it's the thing that's curious is that that option game, that RPO game, seems to favor Bo Perbula. I'm not saying you're going to see a different starter week one. I fully expect it to be Drew Auer. And then it's the conversation you and I have had for months now about Bo Perbula. It's like, oh, we've really not seen him throw the ball a whole lot. Did a little bit in 2023, but wasn't asked to against Ohio State or Michigan. So it's just a little, like, who's this offense built for realistically and then are we going to see it adjusted as the season goes on i think that's inevitable that's every offense you know just explaining that out loud but like 
I don't know that 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 RPO style seems to favor Bo Perbula, and then especially if you're running the ball as much as it's been talked about, it really does sound like there's going to be a much stronger emphasis on running the football than it felt like last year. Mike Yurcich wanted to go to the air quite a bit, and it just became evident that that was not going to be the strong suit of this team. You want balance, like it just feels like a lot of things trying to mash into one. And I guess my my question to you is more so it's like, all right, yeah, I can see Bo Perbula getting involved in the running game. Drew Auer being involved in terms of as somebody you have to respect. How deep down the depth chart of running backs do you expect Penn State to go? Because we know we're going to see a steady dose of Nick Singleton and Katron Allen, but I'm almost looking at guys like Cam Wallace and London Montgomery who've gotten a lot of hype, haven't necessarily filled out in terms of their frame, but – you know, you saw how Trey Potts was very effective last year. If this is an offense that's really going to open things up on the ground, how many backs could we really see out of the backfield? I think you have to really keep your eye on Quint Martin, the, the the freshman sensation that came in in January here out of Pittsburgh, Bill Vernon, a dynamic football player that, you know, is kind of that hybrid receiver, running back that does well in space, can run routes, can, can run the ball between the tackles and implement him into the offense as that, I can't even say slasher, but he's kind of a mixture between Nick Singleton and Catron Allen. And as a top, you know, mm-hmm. level recruit coming in, I've seen him getting work with uh like with Drew Aller and some of the first team guys. So I think those are the three backs that I would be looking to really operate and produce this year. And especially when we keep talking about Andy's diversity and how he runs the ball and with the different backs in the backfield, I think that's the the ingredient and the traits that Quentin Martin has brings a wrinkle into the offense that could be very exciting that's an interesting one to keep an eye on i know there's been a lot of people paying attention to spring practice and curious to see i think the wide receiver position is getting a lot of attention justifiably so not the best production out of that position last year you add julian fleming seems like fleming is doing fine from everything that i'm hearing and not necessarily anything that has jumped out as being terribly alarming or like oh my god he's the greatest wide receiver that ever lived but we'll get glimpses once we get to the blue white game and the the challenge is we're really not going to have a great idea of this wide receiver core justin until august because like you remember last summer how um dante cephas came in and in the early reports that were coming out i was like boy cephas could be wide receiver number one and it's just as you know better than anybody, it's, it's so hard to tell on air at, at right. this point in time versus the summer alone. Mm-hmm. That's true. I mean, there's a lot of things that happen in the spring. I think when we get to like right before the spring game, there's going to be names that come out in press conferences that are showing up. And typically there's probably about a 70% chance that those guys kind of shine through throughout the season. I remember thinking some of my best seasons, even at Penn State, I kind of broke out in the spring, right? Like it's it's like a, a level of confidence that you take into the off season preparation and then it kind of snowball. So I, I do take and put a lot of credit on spring ball for the development of guys. Flipping over to the defensive side of the ball. Um, speaking of the compromise, it was something that's been talked about is that, you know, Tom Allen is being asked to do some things differently than he was asking of his defense at Indiana. How difficult must that be for you go from the head coach's perspective to the coordinator's perspective. That's what Tom Allen's experiencing right now. Not that he has right. uh, zero experience as a defensive coordinator, but you understanding how coaching staffs work. What, what, what's the challenge ahead of Tom Allen just individually going from, you know, total control of a program to it's like, yeah, you're, you're handling one side of the ball. I mean, there's a challenge, but I think there's more freedom to be completely honest. Cause when you're a head coach, you don't, coach as much as you think you do right you're dealing with athletic directors you're dealing with the donors you're dealing with nil you're dealing with transfer portal you're overseeing your ceo at the end of the day because there's just a lot of things that fall on the head coach's plate um at the college level so when you become a coordinator you kind of get back into your mode of you know your swag starts kicking in you start drawing up defenses and it almost kind of some coaches fall in love with the game of football all over again. And then they bring another level of intensity into it. And they enjoy being that coordinator position until something comes up into them where they want to run the whole show again. But that typically happens when they are told or disagree with the head coach and they kind of get sunned by the the big man. It's like, all right, I'm not listening to this anymore. But there's a lot of guys that find comfort in being that coordinator (laughs) and just coaching ball and like developing and cultivating talent with the players. 
And a lot of that, I imagine this time of year, you know, hearing what James Franklin has said and hearing the coordinator speak as well over the last few months is some of it is, okay, here's how Penn State labels certain things down to the word within their playbook. Okay, here's how Tom Allen has labeled this thing within his playbooks over the years. And it's like, what are we keeping? What are we adding? Uh, you know, what makes the most sense? What is our scheme versus the schemes you've run? The minutia of looking at what feels like paperwork <laughs> and then like, okay, what are we actually putting uh, into the install period now for the players this time of year? That that that, uh, that just sounds tedious to me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it is. I mean, football is extremely tedious. I think, I mean, you, t- you think about a Friday night meeting and the, you know, the guy on the sidelines or the coach is going over the signals and there's 60 signals for guys that go, it's like, uh, what's this? We see, I mean, so it's, there's a right. lot of different things. That's why I mean, it's one, a variable heavy sport. And that's why I'm always, when we're critiquing, I'm like, all right, well, I don't know what the variable was or what this, because a lot of things can change based on situations and just the emotional aspect of the game. And then all we get to do is sometimes as fans or commentators to sit back and look at the results and the analytics of all the information, but not take it in the heavy impact of the variables that happen within the game. So I mean, and there's a variables of the impact of the game where you're talking about a physicality where, you know, like men quit and get scared. Like that happens Mm. within the situation that you cannot put on an Excel sheet or analytics or PFF grade. (laughs) It's the human element. That was damn near philosophical. It was beautiful. (laughs) Uh, speaking, uh, uh, you know, staying with the defensive side of the ball, uh, we talked about it, you know, recently is that Abdul Carter's moved to defensive end early reports out of spring ball is that he looks at home in that position. And you, uh, you have discussed it and I was like, Oh yeah, this was, this made sense for him. James Franklin said initially when they scouted him, they thought he was going to be a defensive end and that this was actually something that came at Abdul's request to move from linebacker to defensive end. So interesting that when he was recruited, they viewed him one way, but he was playing at a different position. And then the light switch finally went off for the player individually at his request to move to that position. Um, that, that's got to be an interesting thing for a, a coaching staff to take that directly from the player, because you can imagine there are some coaching staffs around the country that would not listen to something like that and be like, nope, this is where you are and that's where we're going. Talent equals tolerance. Everybody, ladies and gentlemen, talent equals tolerance. Coaching staffs deal with players different based on their talent. So I'm saying that to say, like, yeah, I mean, Aaron Rodgers can operate the way he does in the NFL because he's a supreme talent. So even when we recruit guys coming out of high school, if they play a a certain position, our goal is to get that player into the school, right? Like, we're not going to cut off the relationship to tell them, like, no, actually – you know, you can't play linebacker. You have to play defense. And if this kid wants to play that, because eventually you hope that the writing gets on the wall and the guy develops and you can see like, okay, we can move him here, there to a defensive end. So I imagine when he was coming out of high school, he was probably playing defense in our linebacker. I was like, vice versa saying like, Hey, I want to go to college. I want to play linebacker. People are saying that and like, all right, whatever you want to play, we're going to recruit you that and give you an opportunity to play that because you're that supreme of a talent. And then he got there and saw some struggles or different areas of opportunity that he can have at defensive end based on his skill set and traits. And it's like, all right, let me transition. The same thing happened with like a Levi Brown when I was in school, right? He was a defensive, a defensive lineman that never wanted to switch. And then he got to Penn State playing as a defensive lineman. And Joe Paterno was like, hey, if you go into the offensive line, you could be a top five draft pick. And he switched when he was there and was a top five offensive lineman <laughs> draft pick. So it, it it happens, but when you have that supreme talent, you can bend. So, guys, if you do not have that supreme talent, don't make any demands because they'll just drop you off the board. <laughs> Eating better is easy with Factors' delicious, ready-to-eat meals. Every fresh, never-frozen meal is chef-crafted, dietitian approved and ready to go in just two minutes. You'll have over 35 different options to choose from every week, including Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. My Keto box should be arriving any day now. I'm very, very excited. Also, there are more than 60 add-ons to help you stay fueled up and feeling good all day long. So what are you waiting for? Get started today and get off your goals with Factor. Justin, I have a wild travel schedule and you are one of the most busy human beings I've ever seen in sports. So having something that's flexible for your schedule like Factor is perfect. 
Get as much or as little as you need by choosing your meals every week. Plus, you can pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. In fact, there's a perfect solution for if you're looking for fast premium options with no cooking required, which I love. It's perfect. So head to factormeals.com slash state50 and use code state50 to get 50% off. The link is in the description of this podcast as well as the promo code. Once again, that's code state50 at factormeals.com slash state50 to get 50% off factor meals. Well, you were playing all three phases at one point. And, mm-hmm. and I know I'm sure we've talked about it at some point, but at what point was it like I'm going to just I'm strictly a defensive back now? Well, when I was getting recruited, I mean, Charles Wilson was my favorite player uh, mm. just growing up as a kid. So I always wanted to play both sides based on him. And so through my recruiting process, I was trying to figure out who was going to let me play both ways. And I think it was always in the interest of Penn State for me to eventually go to corner. Right. And they gave me the opportunity to play both ways as a freshman. It worked out and kind of transitioned to just strictly defense. I was a little upset about that because I wanted to still get touches. But, you know, the way that our receiver room and everything kind of developed, it made sense when I understood and took a macro perspective of the team because when we were coming in, that wasn't what the situation was. I didn't know Jordan was going to be who Jordan was or Dion was going to be who Dion was and how everything continued to operate. I thought there would be a little bit more touches for me to continue to touch the ball. But as things developed, I understood that I always wanted to play corner because that was what my future was in the NFL. So it just kind of worked out. When you got to the NFL, was there even the, the conversation of you trying with a receiver? Is at that point you're at such a level, it's like, this is what you are, this is what we're rolling with. No, if anything, at the, at the NFL level, it has to be a situation like Day Day, Daquan mentioned last week where you're returning punts or kick returns in college and you're coming in as a return man. If you're not touching the football in college, they're not going to let you touch the football in the NFL. That's not what this is. Like, there's guys that really make money doing some crazy things with the ball in their hands. And if you just cover people, it's just a different mentality skill set. I remember getting a couple of interceptions in the NFL and I forgot what to do with the football. Like I was like, ah, like, I haven't done this in a long time. It's like J.R. Smith and LeBron. Run that way. That Run way. that way. Yeah. And it's like, ah, I've lost my form. That's why I don't lose your speed, fellas. Oh, man. Uh, sorry, I just was curious about that. Cycling no, it's back. Good, it's a good conversation. I mean, it's, it's, it is because it's like that's career tracking, to be completely honest, because a lot of these guys that are coming out of high school are not going to play the same position in the high school, college. And then there's like a level of having position flexibility that is beneficial. And how do you navigate that and not and become a jack of all trades and a master of none and still be productive as a player? So, yeah, I think that's pretty nuanced, to be honest with you. Sure. Um, cycling back to the current Penn State team, a position that is getting attention now because of the aforementioned Abdul Carter moving from linebacker to defensive end. We talked about it a few weeks ago, but the the question that's been brought up by members of the media and fans in general is just, is there really the depth at linebacker that we all think there is? I think there's a lot of confidence in Kobe King. There's confidence because of the amount of ball that Dom DeLuca has played. And then after that, that third linebacker position, you and I have spoken glowingly of Tony Rojas, but other players like Keon Wiley and KV on keys have been names that have been thrown out there, but Wiley and keys, not nearly as much experience and then Rojas as much as he flashed last year, not as much experience in the grand scheme of things. I, I think he could step in and play a considerable amount, but is that a position that if you're looking at this defense as potentially the weakest position? I'd say most unproven, right? Like, I mean, I guess going into the season, I mean, weak, but like when I look at the talent across the board, if I was just charting the roster, like I wouldn't put too many negatives across the players, right? It'd be more like question marks because of lack of ability or lack of chances to play and like to see where they develop. So with that being said, I think it's just the unproven and you can't stamp it saying it's moving forward. But I think from a talent standpoint, you can feel pretty decent about what they have there when you bunch it up behind that defensive line, right? You take your best linebacker and move them up front. That makes that stronger, which makes the second level of defenders play a little easier, play style a little bit easier. So again, I think it goes hand in hand, but I think it's the most unproven group. Makes sense. And if anything, the talent on the back end, safety especially, 
feels like it could give Tom Allen and this defense a lot of options and a lot of flexibility. And it's something that we talked about with Manny Diaz is that you kind of had a four two five uh, defensive alignment in terms of four down linemen, two linebackers, and five defensive backs. And yes, you're losing King, Dixon, and Hardy at corner. Will you necessarily replace Daquan Hardy with that slot nickel corner? Yeah, pro- unlikely right off the bat, but you can play a three safety look. And you know, we had Daquan on here last week and he was talking about Zaki Wheatley, Jalen Reed, KJ Winston. Boy, that makes you feel really comfortable in the back end if you're only electing to put two, maybe only one linebacker out there, depending on the set. What do you think? New age of college football when teams bring in players through free agency in the NFL, college, I mean, MLB or whatever the case may be, they expect them to play. So when we think about that nickel position, we got to think about the Georgia DB, that transition. Um, AJ Harris, trans- yeah. AJ Harris, that transition in to play that nickel spot when you talk about a bigger corner that has football instincts and is physical, that presents a, a different type of nickel situation. And again, when you bring in players and you pay them through free agency, NIL, whatever the case may be, they're expected to play. So I would think of him getting that rotation in at that nickel spot when you think of that three safety look, but more of that hybrid corner nickel. And you can really do some things if he picks up the picks up the defense the way he needs to. What have you heard specifically regarding the corners? Because the way Daquan was speaking last week of AJ Harris, Jalen Kimber, he said he hasn't gotten to see a whole lot of them, but so far what what is coming out about them is very positive. The way that Daquan talked about Cam Miller and Zion Tracy, I thought that was an interesting one for Daquan Hardy to point out because Zion Tracy and Cam Miller, yes, difficult outings in the Peach Bowl. I think that's putting it lightly, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. That was a tough game for those guys, and especially when you go from your top three corners, uh, your top two corners, rather, Kalen King and Johnny Dixon did not play in the Peach Bowl. Then you had to bump Daquan out to a boundary corner, less of that slot corner spot. So it put Cam and Zion in a difficult position. But everything we continue to hear about Cam and Zion plus Harris and Kimber, all of a sudden I feel a lot better about the depth of corner than I did probably after the Peach Bowl. From what you've heard, Terry Smith especially, what do you feel about this cornerback room? I mean, I think you have to feel good about it from the standpoint of how he's historically recruited guys based on Trace and the way he's been able to develop. Zion Tracy is somebody's a name that I've heard from coaches, players, recruits, parents that have been impressed by what they've seen, whether it's going to a practice or things like that. So that's not that's something uh, consistent. And even Cam Miller, like the way he described him as a hardworking player. I mean, he's also spent time with those guys through a whole season to see contextualize their development right so like i mean with guys that have transitioned in from florida or georgia i'm 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 sure he wouldn't know but yeah i think that's why we call it lockdown you man is because it's a stable of um players from the talent acquisition standpoint a development standpoint and a deployment standpoint and there's a standard for where guys come in if you don't live up to the standard you probably leave (laughs) i mean that is Uh what it is that branding is very important. A smart man created that branding once upon a time. Yeah, Mr. one day. <laughs> <laughs> Before we go here, Justin, this is more of a macro thing about college football. I'm sure you saw it, and it's a little bit old news at this point, but I think it's important. Uh, we haven't even seen the 12-team playoff yet. We'll see it in 2024. Uh, but apparently we're getting a 14-team college football playoff in 2026, so we can include the likes of Notre Dame, who are an independent, and uh, some other at-larges. I, I, I forget the exact breakdown in regard to which teams are now going to be able to make it, but that slight bump out from 12 to 14. My initial reaction was like, can we play the damn 12-team playoff first and like see how that goes? It just feels like it's going to get bigger and bigger. You're going to dilute the playoff. You're going to dilute those early round games you're going to have really really strong competition from the big two in terms of the sec and the big 10 against you know a group of five team you know who's to say you don't wind up with a team that you know say it's second place in the big 10 like ohio state smashing a team like liberty in the first round and it's like man you're just expanding that field and you're making room for freaking notre dame fine whatever but for me, I'm like, why, why can't we just see how the 12 team went first? We're already jumping to a 14 team. 
We saw the NFL at 18 games, right? Trying to add 18 games after adding 17. Yep. Nothing wrong with more revenue, man. We got to recognize, take the rose color glasses off of what we're dealing with. I mean, there's big money in college sports. Add a couple, add a week, add a couple teams, a little bit more money. But even with that being said, we we talked about it previously, like fans, uh, programs, universities going to have to be light on their toes. I mean, especially as the governing body is continuously develop into something else or transition into a new age. I want to have to make things um, competitive and for the TV, TV executives and broadcasters, something that's appealing for them and more games is always more appealing. There you go. <laughs> Tell us what you guys think. Hop at the comment section on YouTube, like comment, rate us, subscribe, turn on notifications, all that good stuff. It really helps the show get at us on social media. Of course, at, uh, State of State Pod on X, Instagram, and TikTok. Thank you all so much for joining us. We're going to keep an eye on spring practices and any headlines that develop, and we're all looking forward to the blue-white game, and we will finally have just a little glimmer of football here in the near future. Thank you all so much for joining us. This episode and our entire library of shows is available now on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, let us know what you think of the show on social media and check out all of our content on X, Instagram, and TikTok. Search for the handle at State of State Pod. State of State is presented by Bet Online and by Blue White Outfitters.